Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. This is our American President's discussion that we're having this evening. Thanks for being here. Before we get too far underway, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you will want to introduce yourselves, feel free to do so in the Q&A section or the comments. You can tell us your first name, where you're connecting from, and your favorite presidents or presidents. It's always interesting to see what people's preferences are. And this is the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Nonprofit Community Organization. Thanks for being part of our event tonight. So this is a historical discussion on American presidents, and it's going to focus on presidents from Teddy Roosevelt forward. And we're going to keep this a historical discussion and not delve into any current politics if we can avoid doing so. And with that, um, for those of you I haven't met before, this is me. My name is Robert Kellerman, and thanks for being here. And our special guest tonight, let me turn things over to him. So, David, you want to take things away? Oh, you have to um, hold on. I have to unmute you. Bear with me for one second. Okay, there you go. Try that, David. I think I think we're unmuted now. Okay, now I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. So uh, when last we met, uh, it was when it was a, a physical meetup group in November uh, 2018, I think, in uh, uh, T, um, Tism. Tism. Yeah, back in the good old days when we used to be able to meet in person. <laughs> That's right. And uh, what's new in Washington? Oh, no, nope, not going to go there. <laughs> uh, but um, so uh, why the presidents? Why study them? I mean, like, well, you know, we really should know American history. It's good to have things in perspective right about now when things are, people are thinking about America and where it's going and where it is right now. And, you know, you have to know where, you, where you've where you been and where you've come from and why things are, are structured the way, way they are or aren't. And so, but if, if you take something, uh, the whole big topic of American history, it's just, it's just too big. And, and I liken it a little bit to if, if you're running for office and you have someone comes up to you and, or, or you go up to someone else and you say, I'd like you to work on my campaign. And they go, well, I don't know what, what to do. I don't know where to start. And they, they probably won't get into it. But if you say, I'd like you to put up a lawn sign. I'd like you to go to so many houses. I'd like you to make so many telephone calls. Would you do that? Would you do something finite? And the presidents are, are very finite. You know, it chops the, the whole of history up into manageable parts and actually quite logical parts because it tells you the ebb and flow of philosophies and political parties and, and culture. And so you, you start with them, you, you memorize them when you are a kid, that is how I got started in this racket, so to speak. Of course, when I was doing it, there were it was a lot easier because there were a lot fewer presidents. But um, even even then, it was it was a bit of a trick for a kid. And from from there, I went on. I got two degrees in history, uh, got the real life job for a couple decades, and blundered into baseball history a different form of history, not the presidential history, which I thought I was going to get into originally, and did a book which did fairly well on the gangster Arnold Rothstein of all people. And when you're an author, the publisher says to you because of your contract, well, we have an option on your next book. What do you want it to be? And I started to roll around ideas in my head and I was just rolling around presidential trivia and thinking, well, how many presidents do you have uh, in a given year competing? And well, maybe in 1960, you've got uh, JFK, you got Nixon, LBJ, then you get into 1968, and then there's Nixon and, and Reagan sneaks in, but no, nobody else. And, and maybe at any given year, you would have, oh, um, a couple, two or three, but in, in, in 1920, I started to roll it around and counting Theodore Roosevelt, who dies in 1919, and it's been pointed out to me many times that, you know, he was dead. He wasn't around in 1920. I know that. I know that. I can read Wikipedia too. But the, um, um, 
but he would have been the candidate of the Republican Party in 1920, and he would have been uh, the, the elected. It was going to be a Republican year. He had warned the American public to be prepared, uh, and it was a very patriotic time once we were in the war. The isolationism had, had fallen away, and so he would have been elected, and then you had five other American presidents who were really in play. I don't mean they were just hanging around or, or you know, uh, alive like a Harry Truman coming back from uh, France in, in the trenches with the artillery or William Howard Taft who was never going to run for president again. But Woodrow Wilson, who wants to be, wants to have a third term, even though you might say, well, he wasn't he incapacitated. Yes, he was but he was sufficiently delusional to think he was popular enough uh, and well enough to, to run. And he sends his secretary of state, um, Bainbridge Colby, to stampede the Democratic convention. That does not go very well. It doesn't even get to the floor. And, and then you have Warren Harding, the available man, as it, one of his biographers uh, referred to him as, a, a senator from Ohio, small town newspaper editor, um, and, um, you know, they ask him at the convention, is there any reason why we should not nominate you? And he takes about 10 minutes uh, to think about an answer. Well, no. And even though he's, he's uh, uh, during that convention, going to see his, his mistress and the, the mother of his child. So there's that scandal looming the whole time. He's, he's a conservative. He is very wishy-washy on the League of Nations at first, which gives... Uh, um, Woodrow Wilson, that stroke ultimately on the tour he is in the Western states. And you have then Calvin Coolidge, his running mate. It's supposedly a very bossed convention, but it, it does stampede for Coolidge. His name is, is put on in uh, from the floor as a complete surprise. And the guy that the uh, big bosses want gets left in the dust and it's Coolidge. Then you have uh, Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover wins two primaries in 1920, and they're both Democratic primaries because he doesn't know what, what party he's in. And he's been serving in the Woodrow Wilson administration. He's always a Woodrow Wilson progressive or a Woodrow Wilson fan for, for all of his life. At one point, a uh, under secretary in the cabinet uh, goes to him and, and, and really wants to put together a presidential ticket with Herbert Hoover at the top and him in the vice presidential slot. And that young fellow is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who there's a little talk about him for the nominations and not, but not too much, but he will be chosen by the Democratic nominee um, to, and there's over 40 ballots that year. That's something to keep in mind how the uh, presidential nominating um, process has changed so much for the Democrats in the conventions primarily, not until 1936 do they get away with their two thirds rule, which causes things like 40 some ballots in 1920 or 1912 or 103 ballots in 1924. And which generally uh, causes the Democrats to come up with not very good candidates is because they're stuck, they've beaten each other to a pulp and then they come up with, you know, sort of a, a guy who's acceptable to everyone except, well, the American people in November. And then that last, um, well, the, that last uh, sixth president is Franklin D. Roosevelt. And the Roosevelts keep popping up in, in all the books I do. The next one I did was 1960, where, you know, I sort of where I started uh, with in terms of rolling around how many presidents are involved in any given year. And, and that was certainly um, a pretty obvious choice because you know, you, you don't have to introduce the characters. You don't have to tell them who, you know, like, you know, the Warren Harding is, you know, you may have to explain him. You don't have to explain these three guys because everybody, even, even the youngsters in the crowd know who they are and they are such towering figures. And I, I start the book by saying they're, they're the product of, of three different ambitions. One is a, um, of a dynasty going down, which was Lyndon Johnson's. 
uh, his father was sort of on the skids, not on skid row, but he had been a county le- or state legislator and then lost his, his race and, and was really uh, in, in hard scrabble times economically. The ambition is dynastic with Kennedy. It was supposed to be his father and then his brother before him. And then Richard Nixon in, uh, oh, just just a ambition of his own. But when he starts out, he's, he's the most normal American guy of, of the three. And I mentioned about 1920, how the presidential nominating process changes. And it changes in 1960 in another very dynamic way. And that is in terms of the primaries. Primaries really weren't the the killer thing until 1960. And even in 1960, most of the delegates are going to be chosen in back rooms, in party conventions by the individual states. And you only get really, I mean, there there are contested primaries, um, but they're not contested very much. In New Hampshire, JFK pretty much has it to himself. In Indiana, he get, gets 80% of the vote against a, a steam fitter and a guy from Chicago manufactures bar stools and campaigns in an Uncle Sam suit. So that the only two big primaries, but they really set the stage for the primary system as we know it today, are in Wisconsin and West Virginia where he competes against Hubert Humphrey. And he beats them both times. And uh, you'd think, well, if he's the only guy running, uh, Kennedy must have the field to himself. But then at the convention, Lyndon Johnson jumps in a week before the, the nomination is going to be held. You think, well, that's just nuts. Who, how is that going to work? Well, because the primaries up to that point weren't the be all and end all, it kind of makes sense. And Lyndon Johnson is the big backroom guy. So he is going to twist the arms and eventually, you know, maybe beat um, Kennedy on, again, second or third ballot. And you were still getting those those, uh, multiple ballot conventions uh, as late as the 1950s. And you were also getting as late as 1956, the convention before 1960, do the math, uh, where Estes Kefauver, Senator from Tennessee, uh, wins the primaries, but he's not the favorite of the party guys, and they give it again to Adlai Stevenson. So you get a big change in 1960, and of course the the change which everyone remembers. I'm sure Joe. Well, one another change with a change which I'm sure Joe Biden, the guy we're not supposed to mention, would would know. This is the Catholic and become president, and but also the big debates, the big debates and the process. Uh, well, what we call debates. And I like to make the, uh, the point that what we're seeing, what we have seen most years, not all since 1960, because they didn't resume again until 1976 when uh, Carter and Ford went at it. And Carter and, and Ford agreed because of, of sheer desperation. He was so far back at that point that uh, these really aren't debates. They're joint press conferences. Uh, Uh, One of the uh, great debates, uh, earlier debates in presidential history, occurs in the next book I wrote, which was 1948. And that's the one with uh, Harry Truman, of course, uh, holding up the newspaper. And he beats Thomas E. Dewey. Dewey won the nomination. He He had been a guy who had won run before in 1944 against Franklin Roosevelt. And in 1948, he has a real rootin' tootin' uh, by the Marquise of Queensberry rules against uh, one of the front runners, a guy who eventually becomes a joke, a punchline in presidential uh, politics because he runs so many times, a guy named Harold Stassen. And they debate in a radio station in studio in Portland, Oregon. One topic, back and forth, opening statements, closing statements, rebuttals, classic debate form on the topic, should the American Communist Party be argued, uh, outlawed? And Dewey argues, no, no, we should not. This is America. We do this out in the open. Stassen says yes, and he loses that debate. Dewey gets the nomination and then, of course, falls to Harry Truman that year. And that's 
that's a year where a, the Democratic Party blows apart, but not blows apart enough to reelect or to elect a Republican, Tom Dewey, who runs a, a very bad campaign. And the party, the Democratic Party splits three ways, not two ways. It splits on the left with the Henry Wallace uh, wing, and he forms what is known as the Progressive Party, uh, actually the second Progressive Party uh, in American history. The first was Theodore Roosevelt's in 1912. And the Dixiecrats, or, well, really the National States Rights Democrats, but everyone calls them the Dix Dixiecrats under Strom Thurmond, later the 102-year-old, was it, uh, a Republican senator from South Carolina. And uh, uh, the election is supposed to be, well, again, what we talk about and talk about and talk about in every election is the polling. And the polling, you know, is, is often one thing and the election results are another. And the classic case of that was in 1948 or one of the classic cases, 1936 is even more spectacular when one polling outfit, the, the Literary Digest gets it so wrong. But most of the pollsters get it wrong and predict Dewey in 1948. But if you take a look at the last poll, which is out, what the margin of error is, and also the, the, the other factor, is that when an election is supposed to be close or something is on the line, you're going to see the third party votes fall away, okay? So not to talk politics, but to talk mathematics. This year uh, or last year, 2020, uh, Trump's vote goes up, but he still loses more. Biden's vote goes up much more. Why? Because the people took, I think, people took the race far more seriously this last time out than in 2016, when just everyone knew it was going to be Hillary, so you could afford to waste your vote. So in 1948, uh, people think it's going to be close, and the votes for Strom Thurmond, which wouldn't have translated into much of anything in the Electoral College except in three or four southern states, but more importantly for Henry Wallace fall away and they fall away in key states like New York and Illinois and California and Ohio. So the math changes a lot there. And then, then I do a book on 1932 and that's the original Roosevelt year. And it's, it's a different format book, even though you know, the format, the, the, we, we stick to the numbers in these titles. But in that year, we compare what's going on in the United States and Germany. And the commonality, I well, aside from the depression and the desperation of people, the commonality in the candidates is that they are underestimated. People think that Hitler is just this, this guy with the funny mustache and yelling and screaming, and he's not going to amount to anything, and he was a paper hanger, et cetera, et cetera. And also that if you do put him in, if you do put him into the chancellorship, he can be controlled. And people, even though the backgrounds are so different and the policies are so different and the countries are so different, people underestimate Franklin D. Roosevelt. He'd been around on that national scene since 1920. But um, as late as 1932, they thought he was a lightweight. Uh, that, that he was not the guy who was going to be able to run the country, that uh, he was a, a rich kid, uh, untested, not particularly um, forceful on the issue, shall we say, straddling certain things like prohibition. Uh, if you read the campaign speeches in 1932, somebody said in, 19, in the late 1930s, I think it was Mariner Eccles, later his controller of the currency, and uh, or one of one of those big um, financial posts who says it looks like that Hoover and uh, Roosevelt flipped scripts and programs because Roosevelt is talking so much about economy, but they underestimate Roosevelt. He's a very savvy politician. He's going to be savvy all the way through once he gets his. Um, I don't want to use the term sea legs, but with him, but. Uh, 
uh, once he understands what the political process is and matures at it. He was not mature in 1920. He makes a, he's not the Roosevelt of 1932 or of the war. And so um, people can underestimate you and, and that can be a great problem. Um, if, if you are one of these people who takes things too easy and thinks you're just going to, to walk into a race or walk into office again. And then the, the last of the books I did doesn't have a, uh, a year title, but it focuses on the 1916 election. And that's TR's last war. It focuses on the, that election and it focuses on the lead up to World War I, the arguments for preparedness. Wilson is very, Woodrow Wilson is, is all over the lot on what he wants to do. Theodore Roosevelt, we know what he wants to do. The winner of the Nobel Peace Prize wants to go to, to war and even wants to go to war personally. He wants to go into the trenches. He wants to go into the trenches and die. Okay, it's this sort of disturbing personality trait that he has. He is, he is, there was a book written a few years ago called The War Lovers, and it was about him and Henry Cabot Lodge and, and, and people that ilk with in, in the war with Spain. And he's a very martial and militaristic person. And in 1916, in those years, this is the downtime of Theodore Roosevelt. It's not the happy times. He's blown the Republican Party apart in 1912 because he hates what William Howard Taft has done in office. And he's soon to learn that he hates Woodrow Wilson more than he hates William Howard Taft ever, or he ever will hate anyone at all, just cannot stand him. And it's very interesting to see also as much is that TR is really launching bomb after bomb at Woodrow Wilson for year after year. And the restraint, which Wilson, who is a very prickly guy and sensitive and, and does not take uh, kindly to, to criticism, uh, uh, knows that he's not going to do well in a, in a debate. And also with a public debate, shall we say, not a, a formal debate with, with Theodore Roosevelt on the issues. And also not to punch down. You know, punching, do you punch down at Theodore Roosevelt? No, because he's a big guy. But yes, because you're the president of, of the United States. And um, Roosevelt, in the title, it's a time of triumph and tragedy because as I started at the beginning of this talk in 1920, the public had come around to seeing him, things his way, would have um, elected him uh, and vindicated him in 1920, but tragedy. Tragedy not only because his death before he can get to the pot promised land, like you know Moses is kept from keeping from there, uh, but also because of the death of his son, Quentin, his youngest son, his most beloved son, uh, as an aviator, and I think his second or third combat mission on Bastille Day, 1918. He gets his war, but he pays a terrible price in the blood of, of his children. And I say children because not only was the one son killed, but two others were very badly wounded. So those, those are the main books on, on presidents that I've written. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Robert, to, to throw a few questions at me, and then we'll, we can take some from the, the folks out there. Oh, good, thanks, I appreciate that. So yeah, if you have a question, type it in the Q&A in Zoom. Um, the challenge will be, we have a big group today. So there's over, let's see, we have 500 plus folks if you count Facebook and Zoom. But anyway, uh -huh. if you do have a question, um, feel free to type it in the Q&A and we'll answer as many of those as we can. So I do have a few for you, David. Um, sure. So you've studied a lot of the presidents and again, not getting into political discussion, but are there any characteristics that make um, certain presidents successful, like some commonalities of, oh, they usually do you know, these three things or anything like that? The most successful presidents are, are tested by wars and great pres uh, crises. Um, you know, the, the, the presidents we think of as, as the greatest presidents are, aside from Washington, 
who really has you know just the founding just just founding the country but lincoln and and franklin roosevelt are are right up on there and whether they whether they can pass those tests you know lyndon johnson does not pass the test of, of vietnam the sheer forcefulness of theodore roosevelt's personality tells you something uh, or tells you something about his personality that he's rated as one of our greatest presidents when there's no no great domestic crisis when he's president there's a panic in 1907 but it's very brief and there's there's no there's no war um so he he kind of gets the rating of, of being greatly successful by by image image in a way and you take a look at what some of the uh his more critical biographers talk about and you see how uh even his trust busting is very um limited in terms of what is to come where william howard taft who is who is regarded as being soft on the trusts busts a hell of a lot more than the great trust buster uh tr and you also get criticisms of why he he lays off uh say things like U.S. Steel uh, and one of his big advisors uh, and, and funders, even in 1912, is, is connected with, with, with those interests. So it's, it's, what, it's, the, it's how you handle a crisis often, uh, but also, um, you know, Kennedy, John Kennedy does not um, face a great war, but the personality the personality and the optics is so great and his charm so amazing um one of the changing things in the presidency and it depends you know how presidents use it and how are they great communicators or not kennedy uses the press conferences up until that point the press conferences were often very private affairs um, many a time they would just write out the, um, Coolidge had an unusual number of press conferences, um, uh, but they would be, all be uh, not for direct quotation and he'd answer what questions he would, that reporters would write them on a slip of paper. And then he'd say, you know, he'd answer the ones he want. And, and Roosevelt's, Franklin Roosevelt's would often be off, off the record, but with Kennedy, they're broadcast. And they were the best show in town. And then you get Reagan. Reagan is, is a great communicator. But it's been, you know, kind of hit and miss uh, since then. The personalities of, say, Lyndon Johnson or, or Richard Nixon, or presentations, rather, uh, really don't, don't come up to that. And, and, um, and then, you know, more recent presidents have, have not used that as much. Um, so we'll, we'll be interesting to see what, what happens in the uh, going forward. Okay, terrific. What about another question is, so a lot of presidents' um, reputation or popularity changes over time. Like, for instance, Harry Truman, he had a very low approval rating uh, during his administration, but now he's considered a very good president. And um, say like um, Woodrow Wilson and Andrew Jackson's reputations have kind of changed over time. How does how does all that work? Like why why is it that a uh, hundred years after someone's dead that their reputation can change, or, or fifty years after they've left office their reputation changes? And is there any presidents that you see kind of um, um, increasing in popularity or stature um, at the current moment? Fashions change, ideologies change, morals change. What people think is important, what people think is is moral or immoral. Um, so, you know, some presidents stay up high forever. Some presidents, like Hoover, stay down forever, or a Harding or Buchanan, stay down forever. Other, uh, as you were mentioning, Harry Truman, when he left office, you know, his approval rating was like twenty or thirty percent. And his reputation does not go up for a good decade. And I write about in 1960 that the, the Democrats were kind of just stay away, just stay away, Harry. You know, they'll mention him occasionally, but he was a little bit like the crazy uncle in the attic and, and they, did, they did not want to showcase him. And you also take a look at he was launching 
bombs at Jack Kennedy. And finally, when he does, when he finally does endorse him, it's incredibly grudging. They ask him, so why are you endorsing him now, Mr. President? Well, because he's the nominee of the Democratic Party. That's all. You know, it's like, oh, boy, there's a ringing endorsement. Um, and, and Eisenhower was, was regarded as, as just a tremendous mediocrity. But now we, we see that, that he was actually a fairly strong leader, but not one who was, you know, kind of tooting his own horn. And he was working more quietly about getting things done. And also, your reputation can change because you're followed by some presidents who are not exactly wonderful. And so your, your period uh, sort of looks like a uh, nirvana. So those presidents go up. A president I don't, I don't think you did mention whose reputation has gone up in recent years is uh, Ulysses S. Grant, in large part, I think, because of his handling of Reconstruction, um, which, is, which is the most forceful of, of any of, of, the, of the presidents uh, involved, certainly more than, than Andrew Johnson. Oh, it's interesting. You, know, you talk about movie. Oh, a popular culture. Popular culture can make uh, or break a, a reputation. There were movies, not only, there was a movie in 1944 filmed in Technicolor, very expensive process, about how wonderful Woodrow Wilson was. And not too long after that, there was a movie about about Andrew Johnson being, you know, not being a villain. Imagine that. I heard um, they're remaking that with Brad Pitt. <laughs> so, uh, are you serious? I don't no, think so. I'm, no, I'm I don't. I didn't think so. But you know, it's it's difficult you never to know. know though. But you never know about anything uh, these days. <laughs> so they just might do that. But they might as well make a movie about uh, Grant because everyone's got a beard nowadays. He was a very young president. That's that's something we forget about him. He was he was a very young president. I think he was like forty six or something when he took office. I was just uh, tweeting with someone about uh, visiting a few years ago. I had to speak in Missouri and visited the Grant Homestead uh, outside of St. Louis, a very very modest home, and within eight years or nine years of living in that little not much more than it's not a shack but it's not exactly a, a gracious living he was president of the united states I, I there's no one i can think of who has had such a rapid rise to the white house from from nowheresville as ulysses s grant so he goes way up and of course what you mentioned Earlier, Andrew Jackson is, uh, you know, I, I think he's, this may be the year he goes off the $20 bill, it was delayed for a while, but I think he's going to be gone pretty soon. And unless they decide to just print currency with all sorts of people on different versions of it, which they could. And uh, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson is, is, used to be a very big guy. When I was a kid, the, the local Democratic club in town, until it was renamed for John Kennedy, was known as the Woodrow Wilson Democratic Club. Um, it was very highly thought of, and he was his reputation went up over the years um, as you know with the founding of the United States, United Nations with Franklin Roosevelt. So he was he was regarded as a, a sort of prophet without honor. Uh, in, in his own land and, and the country felt, you know, very bad that he had been, been treated so, so badly. And, and now that, that has come around 180 degrees. Let's see, and then quite a few people are asking kind of the similar question. How does the presidency, uh, what is, are the unique features about the presidency in the United States compared to like other democracies throughout the world? Any thoughts on that? Well, uh, the presidency, well, we have this parliamentary uh, in many, co most of the democracies are, are parliamentary democracies, you know, like Britain or, or Germany. Um, so you have a ceremonial president. And here the president is ceremonial, uh, but also partisan and, and, you know, gets to do all the dirty work. 
Um, so there, there's that great difference. Um, that causes me to remember I was in Toronto once getting a watch band changed. And the fellow is talking to me about what's going on in America with all the you know, people voting in this electoral college and, or no, it was like, well, I said, well, we're going to vote for, um, you know, senator and representative and president. And he says, why do you vote for so many people? We only vote for one here. We only vote for someone in our riding. Okay. And it caused me to think that while we complain about the electoral college, not being a direct democracy, short circuiting the popular vote and, and being, you know, sort of so backward in regard to the rest of the world, that in fact, with parliamentary democracies, you don't vote directly for Angela Merkel either. You don't vote for Boris Johnson or Trudeau directly. You vote for your par local parliamentarian member of parliament, Bundestag or whatever, and then they vote for the head of government. Uh, so they kind of act like our electoral college. Um, so it's interesting to think of it in, in that way, um, you know, let alone the fact that our whole system is, is based on, on, on checks and balances, you know, two houses of Congress, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the courts. So, uh, but the, the president, the president has, the role has changed so much from, you know, what Washington and the earlier guys thought it would be. Uh, that Congress was supposed to be the preeminent branch of government and the title chief executive. It's that they're going to execute the laws. They're not going to make the laws. They're not going to force, um, you know, the, the idea of so many executive orders, whether it's done by one party or, or another, back then would have been completely, um, I think, repulsive uh, to the uh, founders of the republic and, and to people for a very long time, it would have been Congress is the, is the group that makes the law. And, and it is that um, the presidents are going to just follow and, and, and execute these things and try to make sure there's not too much waste or, or stealing. And you know, after the Civil War, you know, we get that whole string of, of presidents who basically uh, take a back seat to Congress. Um, and, and it's not until Theodore Roosevelt, it, that's probably what makes him, uh, elevates him into that, that rank of, of, the top pres, of the top presidents with people because he forcefully remakes the office and makes it, makes it more active, activist than you know, a Bill McKinley or a Benjamin Harrison or, or even a U.S. Grant. And there was a couple of questions about, um, so you've written two books about Calvin Coolidge. Can you talk a little bit more about him? Because he's not necessarily a, um, like a, on the list of all time favorite presidents like John No, no. So um, how did you get involved in that and maybe tell us, share some insight about Calvin Coolidge? Well, um, yeah, actually it's, the, the situation is worse <laughs> than, than, the, than the audience may, uh, may think because I've done three books, actually not written them. I've edited, edited them. And the third one is Calvin Coolidge on the founders. When he was president, it was at the 150th anniversary of the found, of the, of the declaration and of, of independence. So he got to give a lot of, of speeches about uh, various people who were around at, at the revolution and, and actually very, very good speeches. Now, when I was, uh, when I was a young lad and even when you, uh, get me into uh, when I'm not talking about the presidents and books I've written and stuff like that. I can be very quiet. I can be very circumspect. And I was certainly that way as a kid. So actually my first favorite president was Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, what little boy wouldn't like, you know, cowboy, rough rider, uh, African explorer, all that stuff. And so much more really. Uh, but um, author, for example, a uh, police commissioner. But the uh, Calvin Coolidge was, was known as, as, as very shy 
And there's a story in his, his autobiography about how it was very difficult for him to cross the, the, the threshold, the door into his kitchen when his father had company. And, and it, was very, it was very much like that for me. And I, I thought, well, if, if he could rise and, um, and, and do public service and help people along the way without being particularly flashy, okay, well, there, there, there's a role model for you. And also the idea of, of economy, the economy in words, the economy in government. And the 1920s are also one of my, my favorite periods. Even though the 1920s were, shall we say, not Coolidgean in terms of, of being so reserved, you know, the roaring 20s. Um, I, think, I think what a, what a fascinating uh, period uh, they were. So that's, that's, a, that's a great uh, part of it uh, in, in terms of that. And uh, um, also, now Washington's a, a fur piece from Vermont, but if, um, I if, if uh, you folks ever want to get away up north to Vermont, um, before you get to Burlington and visit with Bernie Sanders, um, go to uh, Calvin Coolidge's birthplace in Plymouth Notch, which is a wonderful scenic uh, place to be. And uh, it's again like uh, U.S. Grant coming from that little house when you see how remote an area and how tiny uh, Calvin Coolidge has come from, came from. It's, it's really quite, quite amazing and, and just beautiful. The whole state is beautiful. I mean, you should see, you should, you should just visit it from that. I live in New York, so I get nothing from the, from the Chamber of Commerce up there. Didn't they wake up Calvin Coolidge in the middle of the night and tell him he was president? Because the yeah, well, that, that's how remote the, the place was. It was so remote and they had one, it's a hamlet. It's not a village, it's a hamlet. And uh, the general store was across the street from where he was staying, which was with, with his father. Uh, the general store had the only phone in town and it's in the middle of the night and no one is in the store. There's no one, no, who's watching the store? Who's watching the phone? So the phone is ringing to tell Vice President Coolidge that, that Harding has died in San Francisco and there's no one to answer it. But there, there are some reporters up to the north in, the, in, in uh, Bridgewater Corners. They get in cars and at like one or two o'clock in the morning, they come riding down and knock on the door and tell Coolidge he is going to be president of the United States of America. And um, he says, well, what was your first thought? He says, I thought I could swing it. And... Um, Oh, you know, he, he could swing it. Uh, and his father was a notary public. So he thought, this is a guy who can administer the oath. And you really should get the oath administered, you know, as soon, soon as possible. So there's no interregnum. But being an attorney and being a very careful, careful collegian sort of guy, he's sworn in uh, again. I think he may be the only president sworn in twice. Okay, because he wasn't sure if the, the first one was legal. He didn't want to take any chances on, on things. Um, and then he walks in the dark over to his mother's grave down the road and then, then comes, comes back and goes to Washington, or to Washington to start running the government. He starts running the government. The government he's living in a hotel, uh, Willard, uh, for a while and, and uh, does not shove uh, Florence Harding the widow of Warren Harding out for, for quite a while. The, the idea of talking about inaugurations, I was doing an interview uh, today about, you know, well, this is going to be a pretty unusual inauguration. I'll grant you that, but is it the only one which is, um, you know, a little out of the ordinary with the big parade and outdoors? And, you know, of course, there's all those following assassinations or presidential deaths. Um, but also the inauguration of Whit Lincoln, which takes place under a tremendous strain, uh, thousands of troops involved there. He has to he has to go circuit, uh, you know, sidestep Baltimore because he's afraid there may be riots and uh, danger there. 
uh, one of the uh, president, one of the uh, things I kind of came across is that when he's making that big trip in from Springfield to Washington to be inaugurated, to take over the country in times of an impending civil war, he stops in Albany, New York, and there's a parade and he goes past the hotel and most likely watching him from that hotel is John Wilkes Booth. And nothing happens then, in part because maybe Booth isn't, you know, wasn't sure what's going to happen with the Civil War or not, but also because Booth had been on stage at a theater about a week or so before and was supposed to fall onto one of those trick knives. You ever have one of those from a magic store where the blade retracts? Well, he had one of those things, and I don't think they had plastic then. So he had a retractable knife that he fell on that didn't retract and cut him up pretty good. And so he was, he was, he was all banged and jup and, uh, you know, um, bad mouthing Lincoln to his, um, you know, the hotel keeper who told him to stuff it. Uh, and, but, but things could have, could, things could have happened even then. Uh, with Lincoln. It, with Rutherford B. Hayes in the big disputed election of 1876, um, Rutherford B. Hayes takes the oath of office two days. Well, actually, uh, Hayes takes it twice. He takes the oath of office two days before the uh, actual inauguration date. And of course, talking about how conventions have changed, the big change in inaugurations is not where they hold them, either privately or at the White House or in front of the Capitol or in back of the Capitol or whether they have a parade like in 1944 is the date. So there was this huge interregnum between November and March 4th until 1936 when a constitutional amendment uh, changes that. But um, often, and I, I correct myself, often presidents would take the oath twice because March 4th would sometimes fall on a Sunday. And people took the Sabbath extremely serious back then. So they would not have the big current, uh, uh, the big outdoor event. They would not have the big parade. And so they would, they would take the, um, the oath of office on the, uh, on the 4th privately, then do it uh, for, for show pretty much on, on, the, on the day following that. And Hayes, because he wouldn't um, take the uh, uh, oath on, the, on a Sunday, takes it two days before the inauguration. So many, many, many changes there. And then sometimes people don't like to discuss hypothetical questions. So I'll throw this out here. Oh, alternative to, history. Yes. <laughs> if you if you want to take a stab at it, fine. If, if you want to punt, that's fine, too. So um, Tim asked. Do you think the U.S. would have ever gotten involved if world, in World War II if we hadn't been attacked? And what do you think would have happened in Vietnam if President Kennedy hadn't been killed? Well, I think... If, if you want to answer that. If, if not... Well, if, let's see. Let's well, um, because I know hypotheticals can be a challenge. I'm like yeah. Jack Benny when, when they asked him, your money or your life? I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Okay. Um, so the first one is... <sighs> There, we are at war before Pearl Harbor. There's an undeclared naval war going on in the North Atlantic. I think it's the USS Kearney or Kearney uh, where, the, where the Nazis, I think, sink it. And that's before Pearl Harbor. And yet Roosevelt, who is doing all the Lend-Lease thing and certainly is, you know, wants to work with, with uh, Churchill, uh, it doesn't go in even then. Um, the uh, more uh, fascinating question is, is take it a step further beyond Pearl Harbor. Okay, so Pearl Harbor is attacked and we, we know what we've got to do. We know what we've got to do now, okay? Uh, but, you know, there's those guys in Europe. There's Hitler, there's Mussolini. And um, do we go to war against them? And then Hitler makes one of the stupider moves of his entire career, which since the invasion of, of Russia has been 
becoming abysmally stupid and declares war on the United States of America for no good reason. Now he's bound to by an alliance with Japan, but since when does Hitler keep his word? You know, Mussolini certainly didn't keep his word in terms of going to war with France and England in September 1939. It was only until France was beaten that Italy jumps in. And what would the Americans have done? You know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember hanging around with uh, folks who were involved in World War II. And the animosity towards Japan, I, I mean, uh, particularly because of Pearl Harbor and, you know, events in the Pacific, they, they played pretty rough. Um, with incredible animosity. So would we have of, of diverted our resources to go to war against uh, Mussolini and Hitler in the absence of their stupidly declaring war on us? I don't think so. I think we would have been at war with Japan uh, and, and, you know, Churchill would have had a much tougher time and Stalin a much tougher time um, going to uh, beat Hitler. And think, think of all the aid which was poured into both uh, Britain and the Soviet Union. There, the joke was that this, in Britain was all the barrage balloons, which they would have up to see, you know, to watch the skies and see if the Nazi planes were coming in. That it really wasn't to see if the, um, if the planes were coming in from, from Berlin. It was, to, it was to hold the island up from all the munitions and trucks and weapons and armaments that we had sent over there. Now, in regard to Vietnam, I think that's a much harder question. And there, there's a big school of thought that Kennedy would have pulled the troops out. I, I really don't know. I really don't know. And I, I suppose I could spend another five minutes saying, I really don't know, but oh, that's I, really okay. don't, I really don't know. <laughs> okay. And then Stephen asks, is the presidential cabinet overrated? He says, it seems like in recent times, there's a lot of scrutiny on the cabinet picks, but isn't most of the decisions made by the president? And do great cabinets or bad cabinets have an impact on how successful presidents are? Well, now there's an interesting question. I worked in state government in New York and at a fairly high level in an agent, actually two agencies. And, you know, when you're at the agency level, when you're running an agency, you, you get to make all sorts of decisions to, you know, keep things running and, and your basic uh, mission. Um, but if, if there was something really big, you, you really ran it past, as they say, the second floor. The second floor was where the governor's office was. And he ran it past his staff. Um, and I suspect, I strongly suspect that it's the same way with cabinet posts and with the, the West Wing, uh, with the executive office building, that you know, you're not going to you're not going to go freelancing. And if you do go freelancing, you're gonna you're gonna be be out of there pretty quick. Uh, so the they're administrators, but I think the important thing is they, they get to argue the case um, from a very specific standpoint to the president. And so, you know, you get someone to break through that, that inner circle, whether it's Halderman or Ehrlichman or, you know, whoever's, you know, or, you know, uh, or someone's relatives, okay? Whether it's the current batch of relatives or whether it's Robert Kennedy, okay? And, and so you, you do get that person who can work as an advocate more, but the big decisions like, like the questioner said are going to be, um, are gonna be made often by, by the big guy or someone who, who works down the hall from the big guy. Was there a second part to that question? 
Well, there, there sort of is there. So the, another question was kind of sort of related, but not exactly was um, which first ladies have had the most influence on the president's thinking Not you know, not which first ladies were most popular or got most impact, which ones actually helped change the thinking of their uh, husband on different issues. Any particular ones come to mind? Yeah, I think I think uh, I think number one would be um, Nancy Reagan, because it would go back further than getting to the White House. You know, the guy was a Democrat, you know, when he marries Nancy, he's a Democrat. And she comes from an old line Republican uh, family out of Chicago. And so I, I think she moves him along from that point on. And they, they're, they're just remarkably close. So even though we really, oh, oh, and certainly with AIDS, if there was somebody Nancy didn't like, uh, that person was in trouble, okay? So she'd be extremely influential. Then we jump back to someone who by kind of default becomes the most influential um, once they're in the presidency, which is Edith Bowling Galt Wilson after Wilson has his stroke. You know, she's called the first, first you know, woman, woman president. Um, and you know the, the stroke is large. Not it, the stroke is not kept from the American public, but the extent of his incapacity is, and and people just don't see him um, for a good year of, of the last year of his presidency. Um, uh, Nellie Taft might have been, but Nellie Taft is the one who suffers a stroke early on in the presidency. And so she's incapacitated. And Eleanor Roosevelt, um, those four books, 1932, 48, 60, 1920, um, they, there's one person who shows up in all of them and not just as some obscure footnote and it's Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and Eleanor, even though the relationship between her and Franklin is not exactly storybook uh, after it is discovered by Eleanor that uh, Franklin has been having an affair with her former social secretary, and that's in 1917, where it becomes very much a, a um, political partnership, and they don't always see eye to eye. To eye. Um, Franklin is a much more calculating individual and um, Eleanor is more idealistic and they are, they are particularly divergent on racial issues where she would be pushing him for, for years to do something with um, anti-lynching legislation, which, which becomes a factor with the NAACP in the mid 1930s when, when lynching goes up again. It declined in the 20s and it started to go up again in the depression. But he's, he's, he, he is always saying, no, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm afraid of the Southerners in the Congress. They control things. These are, these are the tools I've been given to work with. They're not the tools I prefer, but I'm not gonna jeopardize the whole agenda, Eleanor. So you can say what you want, but, but I'm not going forward. But she said what she wanted and um, I, I think was, was um, um, certainly a great influence politically and in ginning up support for, for Franklin and, and getting out into the, into the hustings. Um, I think those would be, you know, uh, some of the star performers. And I'm sure I've left someone out. Oh, no, that's okay. Here's a, um, th I thought this is a really interesting question. So uh, Jennifer says that usually when we talk about elections, historic elections, we talk about things like presidents doing well in certain um, geographical areas or with certain segments. But what about men versus women? Have there been any presidents during their elections that they really did well with more so women than men? Well, there's been of, of late there's been pretty much a gender gap of, um, of, of you know, we say the gender gap favors um, Democrats, 
because we're measuring women's vote. If we if we say if we define it as uh, measuring men's vote, then the gender gap favors Republicans. But um, in any like case, John F. Kennedy more popular with women than Richard Nixon because he had boy, I would think so. <laughs> you know, when when you get a big blowout, it it probably doesn't matter too much. One of the uh, one of the um, you know, I hesitate to see after all the bad polling we've seen historically and, uh, you know, recently, I hesitate to quote polls. So I, I, in this case, I will quote not a poll about uh, a gender gap, but actual, actual tabulation. When Warren Harding is nominated against James M. Cox in 1920, Cox is a Democratic nominee and he's running with Franklin Roosevelt. The state of Illinois tabulates votes, okay, uh, by gender. And Harding does, does, does particularly well with women, okay? He's, of course, he's a better looking guy, you know, if you don't, if you don't look at his big gut <laughs> but but he's he's got a, he's he's got great features and as they say he looks like a president and he does he does better now one of the things in, in that in that 1920 book one of the things is is all the backstories the league of nations for example and prohibition and the clan starting to to roll into into gear and uh, one of the things is is suffrage and, and how um, the country moves towards women's suffrage, which it does in 1920. I mean, women could vote in certain states, but it's a nationwide thing with, with that amendment. That's the first year where all the women can vote. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a great story. But in uh, 1920, this is, this is not what you would expect based on, on current attitudes or um, events that the um, it's the Republicans who back women's suffrage, not the Democrats. Uh, you can see this in the votes in Congress. You can see it in the votes, particularly in the state legislatures. You can see in terms of the aggregate number of state legislators voting for or against. You can see it in which states ratify and which states don't ratify. Uh, it goes down in flames in most of the southern states. It, the final package comes in Tennessee. But in most of the southern states, it is outright rejected. Um, and and in, in New York State, for example, um, they held one referendum. This is very late in the game. I think it's in 1915. They, they, they have a series of referenda. Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, big important states. And women's suffrage loses in all of them. You know, it was a Western movement. In the East, the East was not, not into it. The South certainly wasn't into it. And the Northeast wasn't into it either. And then, and, and it was because the votes uh, in the Republican upstate area would be for suffrage and it would lose downstate. And why? Because of the, the immigrants coming in from traditional societies in the big cities, the democratic constituencies in the, in the Northeast. And they, they were not particularly for women's suffrage, nor were the more traditionalist societies, white Southern society. They weren't interested in it, in, into it either. So it was, it was more your rural or middle-class or small town uh, communities and women who supported it because you know not all women supported it uh, either. There were there were organizations of women who were uh, opposed to it. And then here's a question from Diane. So in the United States, of course, we have the three branches of government: the legislative, executive, and just so has the has the presidential power in terms of relations to the other two changed over the past fifty or hundred years? Has the presidency got more um, powerful? I guess at the expense of those other two branches. Or is it still the well, same? Well, I think the courts. I think the courts are holding their own. They're they're definitely holding their own. The Congress has has largely lost ground, I think, and and the presidency, again, with those executive orders, and the ability to, I think, mold 
legislation and to send more legislation to the Congress. You know, really starting in force with FDR in 1933 with the first hundred days and, and uh, you know, not just waiting for Congress to come up with a bill, but to, to have a fully formed legislative program, which the Congress then looks at. And, you know, it'll make its changes. It will do what it, what it does. But yeah, I think the presidency is, you know, what was it? Um, Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s term, the imperial presidency and the trappings of the presidency where in, in terms of, of all the bells and whistles and perks that go with the office, you know, I think it, it's, it's probably more than the Queen of England has. You know, uh, nothing, nothing was too good for the president. And um, uh, another, presidential libraries are great things and I'm a historian, but you know, it's, it's, uh, is it, is it like a cult of personality where we fund all of these things, uh, you know, starting with Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, by the way, um, is, is, are we, are we investing, um, too much into these things? Now, certainly the national archives, which will have a role in the, in the presidential libraries should be preserving these things. One of the, one of the things which is, um, Lyndon Johnson's, uh, you take a look at his website from, from the presidential library and they present a lot of unvarnished things. Um, I, I do not think the Kennedy library, when you go to the museum, it looks, it's a kind of happy face kind of, of experience, but the um, Johnson, well, there's a lot of warts there and the Kennedy library, or I mean the Kennedy, not the, the Franklin Roosevelt, presidential library puts on a uh, Ro Roosevelt reading festival every year. Well, not 2020, not this year probably, or last year. And they bring in uh, authors and they, um, they have a full program. They have double or triple track uh, talks by, by the authors about books about Franklin Roosevelt or somehow related to Franklin Roosevelt. And they don't censor what is coming out on that. Uh, they play it very fair. So, you know, there, because there, there are a lot of things one can question about, well, any president and, and even about a president with a, with a big reputation like Franklin Roosevelt. Did, the, did he do enough to end the depression? Did he, what did he do about the Holocaust? Did he know about Pearl Harbor? keeping the infirmities that he had secret, uh, whether it was the polio or the, or the last in, uh, in um, sickness, the internment of the, of the Japanese, should he bomb the camps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And all these things are, are open, to, open to question. So some of these things are very good, but um, you know, um, are, we, are we making them into almost monarchs? And, and that's, you know, we, we have to judge these things because, you know, you might like the president today or the president yesterday or whoever, but you might not like the guy um, to come or the guy before. So um, be, be careful what you wish for in presidential power. And then one last question, and then we'll let you go. It's, it's a two-part question. So you were talking about presidential libraries and museums. Do you make use of those resources when you're writing your books? And then do you have a favorite? We won't, we won't ask if you have a favorite president because that's a broad topic. But yeah. do you have a favorite presidential library and museum? Oh, I, I think the, Rose, the Franklin Roosevelt one. Um, because um, uh, it starts with him, you know, and he designed it. This is interesting. He, he's the only president who had a presidential library when he was still in office because he was supposed to leave. He wasn't, you know, it was like, uh, or, you know, at least that's what the story was of the public that he was going to leave and not do a third term. Although if you, if you go back into the 1936 election, you see a lot of rumblings about, about is, is he gearing up for 1940? And so he actually designed the buildings and that's one reason why the buildings there can't be changed because they're historic. 
or the facades because they were designed by a president of the United States. But um, uh, that was, I think, the first one I went to as a kid. And, um, you know, they, they keep finding more stuff and you have to cram. It's like the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. There's more history happening all the time. and There's more stuff which you find out about Roosevelt or more artifacts which might come in but uh, you, you, you can't put them anywhere more. There's just no more room. And then you have the house and the grounds, <clears throat> and then you have Eleanor's place up the road. So it's very handy. In fact, I was just asking one of the archive people um, in um, uh, Hyde Park for some information the other day, and, and they're, ver they're very good, they're very good. Well, I think we've taken up enough of your time, so appreciate. And I think I'm losing here. my voice. Oh, <laughs> I was gonna say let's keep going. So unless I have a, a swig of water, I'm gonna have to stop. Oh no, we've used up your time. But maybe we can invite you back at some point in time in the future because we got a lot of questions, way more than we. If we um, asked you all these questions, we would be here till midnight because we had a big turnout. No, so thank not you midnight. Everyone for participating, and we'll try and get David come back and chat with us again um, sometime in the future. And David, thanks so much for being here and. Happy New Year, and we'll check back with you at some point in time in the future. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.